Welcome to What That Old Queen? A candid and adult take on queer life quandaries at a certain age. So please listen at your own discretion. Presented by Bernie and Tommy, their views are their own and in no way reflect those of any service you may hear this program on. Now, let your ears be upstanding for the <coughs> old queen. Hey Tommy. Hi Bernie. Uh, <laughs> hey, we're back. I know, it feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. And happy birthday. Well, you're a bit late. <laughs> <laughs> no, I meant for what that old queen. Okay. We're two years. That's cute, isn't it? Yeah. That's why we're drinking bubbly. Well, I've got some more bubbly in the fridge. Mm. Very nice. And by the time this comes out, we'll know if we've won an award or not. What do you think? I don't know. I mean, it's nice just to be nominated, isn't it? I would say so, yes. Like being in the top 10 of the world, LGBTQ, WXYZ plus <laughs> podcasts. That's what we are. That's what we are. We're in the top 10. Of the, what's it called? The readers? The people, the readers' wives. <laughs> the, re- re- <laughs> <laughs> the People's Choice Podcast Awards. Mm. Yeah, so. Do you know who the people are? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it came as quite a surprise <laughs> that we were nominated. So <laughs> this year, I did enter it a couple of years ago, but um, yeah, I didn't think we'd even get a look in this year because I didn't do anything. Mm. But now we're in the top ten, so I'm not. I'm Fing- not going to knock it. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. We'll know by two days before this comes out. <laughs> I did a poll today on my Instagram. Yeah. Because I just had my eyebrows threaded. Oh, yeah. Oh, I hadn't noticed. And um, I did a poll and 100% of people think that I look better with them. 100%. 100%. How many? What, how many people voted? Yeah. Last count, it was 16. Okay. So you can't really say that people are apathetic anymore, Uh, No, you you can't. (laughs) (laughs) How many followers have, have you got? Well, actually, a lot of people have looked at the picture and haven't voted. Uh, is it like Brexit? Feels a bit like yeah. Brexit. <laughs> There's more at stake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the word that should not be named as to why we're in such a state in this country. But uh, yeah, never mind. Let's not talk about that. How, how was your summer break? Um, it was good. I just, um, I mean, throughout the whole spring and into summer I just worked so hard I made so many shows and then I decided that I wasn't going to do much performing and then I just sort of felt I just feel weird without performing actually Mm. I feel sort of depressed if I'm not performing and then if I am performing I feel anxious so you've got a choice do you want me depressed or anxious um I want you happy (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i think i need a gig and do another gig yeah 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 uh, well you, i did see you perform recently at a wedding we went to a oh yes i forgot about same that same yeah. sex couple wedding yeah. congratulations yeah. andrew and matt andy and matt yeah. thanks for having us it was possibly the gayest gay wedding i've ever been to well tell everyone about the um <laughs> table layout <laughs> the, t- the table layout it was all named after steps songs we were on something in your eye we were on something in your eye but i i thought um we should have been on it was the last thing on my mind or better best forgotten (laughs) (laughs) me personally anyway yeah Yeah. not not you obviously Mm. tommy um (laughs) what else is that oh we went to gay shame yes that was fun yeah and we had our picture taken with harry clayton right Mm. who we'd quite like to have on the show and he did say yes so maybe he will, you know. Yeah, leave that with me. I'll sort that out. Grace us with his mm. presence. I quite like that. I finished an audio book, which is coming out, Spooky Stories. Um, What's it called? It's called Sometimes You Just Kill the Wrong People. Well, ain't that the truth? I know. <laughs> it happens to me all 
the time. Um, but yeah, just in time for Spooky Halloween and Spooky Tales for Winter. It's a collection of short stories. Some of them are quite graphic in, in terms of being gory. Others are kind of spooky. Some are strange. Some are funny. Um, and some of them are quite touching. It's like the whole... Gamut. Yes, the gamut of emotions, which is strange for a collection of horror stories. But it's a little bit like Tales of the Unexpected or The Outer Limits or The Twilight Zone because they're all kind of strange, odd tales. Um, And hopefully I've done them justice. Oh, I'm sure you have, Bernie. (laughs) Let's hope so. What did you think of the vigil? Did you watch that? Oh, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Did you feel a bit claustrophobic? I did. I mean, it just made you feel more and more claustrophobic, especially with that final episode. Mm. <laughs> it was just crazy. But, I, yeah, maybe we shouldn't give the game away by saying what actually happened. But I absolutely... I, I, I'm actually not sure what did happen. Well, I found the whole thing quite confusing. I mean, I enjoyed watching it, and it was gripping, and it made me feel very... Like, it made my breathing change mm. in the terms of, like, panic. But I don't, I couldn't tell you the story if someone said what happened. Yeah, well, it was quite political and it was all about nuclear deterrent and things like that, wasn't it? So I thought it was mostly about her eyebrows, personally, (laughs) because they were exceptional. Uh, Is that why you went for the eyebrow threading? I think you're trying to match that. I think, yeah, it sort of touched part of me that I didn't realise. And subconsciously, I must have, like, thought, Eyebrows like Soren Jones. I had to calm down my... Well, the first time I saw myself acting on camera, I had to calm down my eyebrows because they used to go up and down every time I spoke. Mm. And I had to teach my face not to do that. <laughs> they were literally all over the place. I'm just watching them now. <laughs> it, they have been moving quite yeah. a lot. <laughs> there's, yeah, but the, I mean, there's an awful lot else going on with my face now, so you don't just see the eyebrows. <laughs> And segueing into our next bit, I have my DNA done. Mm. And I'm now Scottish. That's all right then, isn't it? Yeah. Scottish and Norwegian, which is all very Viking. Well, I'm 26% Scottish and 11% Norwegian, but I'm embracing all of that. But what, when you say you're Viking, do they tell you when the. No. When, the, when you were like. When you do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, no, they don't say. <laughs> but I imagine because it's they don't put no, a date on it. It's Norwegian. Mm. It comes over, and I've gone back as far as I can with my family tree, and I can't see any Norwegian there. So I'm assuming it's Viking when they came over and invaded. Why not assume? Well, I, exactly, and I'm going with that. And so I thought I'd look into what the Vikings thought about same sex. Couplings. Oh, I expect they were all over it. Well, um, yeah, I just wanted to see how they felt, uh, how like their society felt about homosexuality. And there were female warriors, mm. which is good. So gender roles were interchangeable. And like many historical societies, uh, homosexuality was acceptable. So they were, the men were allowed to have sex. There was a lot of raping and pillaging that went on. Mm. Um, <laughs> Same sex and different sex. Mm. But it seems that if you bottomed, you were less of a man. That was what they saw in that society. And I think we had that with the, when we did the, the Romans. Romans and the Japanese as well, um, where it was kind of acceptable, but they saw... Mm. Like, which, which brings me to our next kind of subject... Oh, it's all, you've segued it all in very nicely, haven't you? It's almost like I've thought about this. (laughs) (laughs) So the term mask for mask, because I saw some posts um, by Scott Flashheart, who does Probably True, who's a guest on the last season. um, And he put up a very interesting kind of note on it, how it wasn't very good. So I thought I'd, I'd look into why this is a problem. I mean, how do you feel about it? Oh, I hate it. Yeah. And if I see it, then I just block that person. So I don't, I, yeah. 
I don't have to interact with them at all or yeah hopefully more people will feel the same way so that eventually they'll be on those platforms and there won't be anyone else in the room <laughs> well that, yeah they'll just be on their pla- those platforms on with their, themselves yeah yeah great um so i looked into this and i found an interesting article um called discovering mask for mask byline it's not just a sexual preference it's exclusionary and oppressive by justin clay so i'm going to read some extracts of this and then we'll discuss so uh the phrase mask for mask which many gay men use on dating apps to describe themselves. They do this to indicate that they are masculine acting and are seeking other masculine acting individuals. Those who use the term tend to be straight passing men who refuse to communicate with anyone other than straight passing men and therefore dismiss and or degrade feminine or androgynous people. They sometimes use the term no femmes as well. Some try to defend these actions and preferences by saying things like, everyone has a type, it's just a description, and it's not what I'm into. But I certainly find mask for mask problematic. The phrase excludes feminine, androgynous queer individuals, a type of exclusion that speaks to a long legacy of internalised homophobia and misogyny, both in the gay community as well as the broader society. Ingrained homophobia teaches us to accept and normalise relationships that fit into a heterosexist framework and oppress queerness, while ingrained misogyny simultaneously teaches us to privilege masculinity over femininity. Being queer in this type of society already marginalises gay men, but the way in which they represent their gender and sexuality in their own community can ultimately marginalise them further. In a world that expects men to be stereotypically masculine, being effeminate leaves you particularly vulnerable. Do you think this is... you? When we had this discussion on Sunday, you just went, it's the patriarchy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's sort of... I, I, I was just trying to find who wrote the article. Oh, right. It's actually from 2016. Okay. And it's, it's off... Uh, it's actually on the MTV website. Okay. So... And I think it's just someone who wrote in mm. to say that this is a problem for them. Oh, okay. I just felt like this is so steeped in misogyny, the patriarchy and feminist issues, really, Mm. that the only reason why it's been brought to the attention of the gay men is because we have now some sort of... We can maintain some level of order and power Mm. so that we can point out these errors of... I'm not very good at judgment. Explaining. Judgment, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because so, so it's something that uh, from straight society, which has kind of infiltrated through into our community, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. And we and yeah. for some reason we feel like we have to, or some members of our communities feel like we need to perpetuate that. Yeah. Even though it's wrong, mm. but I mean, I think some people don't even realise that it's wrong, or they don't even realise why they feel like that. Mm. And actually, it is just this hangover of straight society, isn't it? There was a really good conclusion to this. So um, I won't read the whole article, but it says, while misogyny and homophobia are two separate yet often overlapping spheres of oppression, they are only pieces of the story when it comes to gender, sexuality and systems of identity. Race, socioeconomic status ability, global position and other sexualities and genders are also parts of this broader story that need to be told and listened to in order to achieve true equality. So, But it is interesting how just that little phrase on a dating app is so loaded Mm. with so much Mm. oppressive history Mm. for society, for women, for... Mm all of the LGBTQIA plus society. Mm. And it is a bit weird that even in our own society, because we don't realise that, even in our own community, we, we, we're we kind of perpetuating it, aren't like, we? Language is very important. And I think that we're, yeah, really only just beginning to discover that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway, 
we've got a guest coming in. Because they're really coming in. They're really they're literally going to arrive any minute. It's like, it's really fun <laughs> that they might just knock on the front door. I know, because we're going to have them in real life. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of on Zoom. <laughs> so we have uh, Double Doctor Andrew Haig Ferguson. Why are they double? Uh, because he's got a double doctorate. But we'll talk about that. Okay. A.K.A. Mother from the now infamous Don't Tell Your Mother from Bristol, and also on Instagram, Pam Sandwich. So we can talk about all of that with him and the fact that he's a health psychologist and a clinical psychologist. So maybe he'll have some, uh, you know, something to say about Mask for Mask as well. I'm sure he will. I reckon he will. Yeah. And he's going to stay around for the problem pages. Of of course, he's going to give the best advice. Yeah. Well, I hope. <laughs> when when we when we were talking about this before, you just said that I always say what why are they contacting us? <laughs> <laughs> hopefully Andy might. Because they want they obviously want words of wisdom from, you know, the old queens. But now we actually have a qualified person coming in <laughs> to give some advice. So we'll look forward to that. So we will have a little break now and we'll be back after this. Please like and share this podcast. Tell all your friends you're listening. And if you can spare some cash, please donate to our Patreon or our button on our website. Oh yes, push the button on our website and give us some cash today. Oh yeah, yeah. A dooby dooby doo. Thanks for listening and all your support. We love you. Oh, yes, we do. Right, so we're back and we have a fabulous guest. It's quite exciting, Tommy, isn't it? Because we've actually got someone in real life. And this hasn't happened for quite a while. Very long Um, time. And uh, we have Double Doctor... Andy Haig Ferguson. Hello. Hello. Uh, AKA Mother yes. from Don't Tell Your Mother. Yeah. AKA Pam Sandwich. Correct. Yes. Triple identity. Is, so, is Pam the same as Mother? Mm, she's in the same ballpark, but she's maybe a younger version, but not the same. Jane McDonald? Yeah. Maybe Mother's more Jane McDonald. Pam's more younger version of Jane a- McDonald. What about Amy from Made in Chelsea? What's her name? Amy Childs. I was I watching don't... her on um, this morning where she said that she had a problem with the way that she spoke, which I can relate to because I hate the sound of my own voice. And she said that she really would like to speak like Vanessa Feltz. Oh. Oh, that's an odd... <laughs> <laughs> And then as if by magic, Vanessa appeared on the Zoom screen. Oh, wow. And taught her to speak proper. Oh, was really? she expecting her to be there? Or was she just like hanging out in it was the background? Ju- it was all on Zoom. Yeah, Scary. so it was all... Um, so Vanessa Phelps does <clears throat> elocution lessons. So it would seem, yeah. Okay, maybe, maybe I'll see her. Uh, I, I obviously need some. <laughs> <laughs> but they had a long conversation about how to say bejazzle. Be- bejazzled? Mm. Uh, was that correct? I'm not sure. Bejazzle. <laughs> 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 Vanessa got a bejazzle. I would have thought so. Probably. Oh, okay. Um, Looks like she would. Where Where did your inspiration come from for Mother and Pam Sandwich? Well, I think um, probably Mother was a bit of... It probably Jane was McDonald. a bit of <laughs> Jane McDonald. <laughs> and, and also... Um, there's a thread of uh, Kitty from, um, you know. Oh, yes, um, Victoria Wood. Yeah, 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 Victoria Wood. And Victoria Wood, I guess, as well, maybe sort of a, a thread kind of in there. Um, yeah, so kind of those thrown in. And the look wise, I think it's probably um, Jake McDonald. Yeah. And Andy has okay. been to this gaff before. I feel like you sat at that very I think spot. I did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you regaled us with. 
Victoria Wood yes. anecdotes. Yes. Got a favourite one <laughs> that you want to share with the group still? Um, I like the uh, I like the shoe shop sketch. Uh, yeah, that's one of my favourites. Yeah. 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 Um, and I can't remember it off the top of my head, which is yeah. unhelpful. But the one that she rips the heels off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Flat and <out. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I like the one about threesomes. Oh, I don't know that one. Do you not? <laughs> well, I don't recommend it because he watched, they watched Take the High Road with the sound. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, do you remember that very small neighbour of mine? <laughs> Binds children yeah. clothes and spends, spends the, the VAT, VAT on, on tequila. tequila. <laughs> yeah. I wondered why he had that cat that <laughs> wide. <end>. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yes, it's all coming back to me. <laughs> so you, but you're from up north, aren't you? I can yeah, detect that in your um, accent. Midlands. Uh, yeah, the Midlands. But, yeah. Um, yeah, sort of, I guess, uh, feel more drawn to the north than the south. Northern women. <laughs> yeah, northern, northern women. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. No- northern female comics. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Very. F- and also, it's that kind of sense of humour that you have mm. as well, isn't it? And that's kind of brought out in your drag personas. Yeah, yeah. As it were. But I imagine you have to have a bit of a self sense of humour to be a psychologist as mm-hmm. well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think certainly not not necessarily taking yourself too seriously at times and and not taking things not taking things too much to heart as well because I think um people yeah, you know, be meeting people in all sorts of states and things and people can say and do various things because they're in pain or they're mm. in distress and things. And I think it's it also fits with kind of jobs where you yeah you are working with the sort of the darker side of life and often you end up developing maybe a bit of a dark sense of humour because of that as a way of coping um, mm-hmm. a way of managing some of the difficult stuff that you have to process um, as a professional that mm-hmm. you come in contact with uh, so yeah I'd agree I think that there yeah you you sort of end up developing a interesting humour. <laughs> to manage some of that stuff. And what what drew you to psychology? Um, I think being nosy, <laughs> <laughs> being being nosy in in a sense of being interested in people and interested in what is going on under the surface and what kind of people mean and what makes people tick and relationships and just. And helping people, I guess, as well. Um, mm. Yeah, don't forget about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right at the end. <laughs> um, and I, I, I mean, both my parents worked in... Were, um, I mean, they're, they're still around, they're retired now, but um, they were both in the medical profession and things, so it was sort of... That was kind of in the air, I guess, kind of growing up, the sort of talk about working with people and stuff and that sense of, um, I guess, that kind of value of helping people and being of help to people uh was kind of there all along i think it was about sort of maybe 14 15 when i thought yeah psychology that's something i'd like to go into yeah um, does mother is she a health professional in the daytime <laughs> um mm, i think that she tells people she is but maybe she she works on the front desk somewhere and she gives out advice when she maybe could she be a receptionist Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah yeah and so she's a she is um she overhears a lot of stuff and she um has to go through notes and she types letters and things so she knows more than maybe she should and she shares more than she should (laughs) she thinks yeah she thinks she knows more than she really does okay and how much of that is you as well (laughs) (laughs) yeah i mean i think uh probably there's there's a chunk of that which i could relate to yeah yeah. and and at times feeling like i think we always talk about in um well i think probably in lots of professions but particularly what i've noticed within psychology is people talk about uh, like the imposter syndrome and feeling like um even when you're you studied and you're working and things and even people who've been working for a long time will sort of say i don't i feel like i'm going to be found out i feel like um mm. i'm not i don't know stuff or i can't do this or 
like what am I supposed to do in this situation so yeah I think there's a, a sense sometimes that um yeah that that can feel a bit consuming but I think it's really interesting that you say that because I, I, I've worked as a advisor for artists and that's always the first thing that people always say is that they have this imposter syndrome and I'm advising them and I'm like well I'm feeling it more than you so yeah yeah yeah, it's yeah. I real. think I think I think we all have it to a certain extent, and um, I think in some ways it's a good thing to have because it stops us from becoming too too kind of gung ho about things and, and too sort of sure of ourselves in a in a negative way. Because I think if if we didn't have any of that, it's sort of humility in in a way. I think people can be quite dangerous when they're like that, when they just they think they know everything and and um, and yeah, don't don't have that sense um but it's managing it in a way that doesn't become all consuming and um that, that keeps you balanced that, that kind of keeps you grounded but i think there's certainly times when you know we all can have ups and downs of mood and things like that and, and when i'm feeling maybe a bit more kind of fragile um at times or a bit more kind of anxious it can definitely feel like um that stuff can become more consuming yeah so we were talking earlier about how some of the language that we use in the LGBTQ plus community it can be problematic and it's kind of seeped through from fitting into a straight society. And we were talking about the word mask, basically, a mask for mask. What, what do you feel about that? Because I feel like some people don't even realize why they're using it and actually how loaded that is uh, which i guess is more of a sociological thing as well yeah. as psych- psychological <laughs> um i think lots of terms and and ways of describing things can sometimes just be used um as almost uh, some sort of shorthand or something or, or just kind of or as you as you rightly say that actually people don't necessarily think about what that could mean or where that's kind of come from i mean i guess part of it is about talking about how you present your own kind of gender identity or sort of how you feel you are in the world um and and what you would like kind of from someone else but i think that just breaking somebody down to just one descriptor i guess there's there's a few problematic things about uh, about it um but one of which feels like it is about breaking someone down to just one kind of descriptor and and people are so much more than just one thing um and it could it feels like it could be yeah just well it's i mean it's quite discriminatory in some situations um and there there could very well be somebody who's perfectly right for this person but because they're not mask they're automatically cut out of what they kind of want um and it can be confused with toxic masculinity yes yeah I totally. think it often is because i think it, it does harken back to when uh society particularly in this country where it was less acceptable to be gay as well so it was almost like you were too scared to be feminine yeah and yeah. or camp you know, but and then part of our society actually celebrates that as well. It's it is a bit weird. There's like a, yeah, a duality there with yeah, some of it. Yeah, yeah. And but they but they celebrate it in the way that they make fun of it. So it's again that's also can be slightly problematic. Yeah, yeah. And I guess it's it's it it does feel like it's it's making some sort of hierarchy about what, as you say, what what kind of gay is okay to be, and that the mask is kind of seen as this sort of for some people that's the that's the apex that's the kind of that's the best kind to be mm. um and everything else is just rubbish yeah um and that's not okay yeah, um yeah. because actually there's lots of ways to be everything um, yeah and celebrate the whole spectrum yes, of exactly. lgbtqia plus yes, yeah totally is there anything in particular uh, are there like particular psychological issues which are quite prevalent in our community i don't know for certain but i would suspect that um there probably will be um issues uh, like there are in in the wider community like with depression and anxiety and and low mood and and things like that uh, kind of more generally 
Um, and within anxiety, there's sort of different things like social anxiety and, and generalized anxiety. Um, and, um, and obviously there's degrees of kind of depression and things. And then there's, there's sort of more um, mental health problems um, like sort of psychosis and um, probably the, uh, the label of kind of personality disorder as well, which is, can be quite uh, controversial. But I would have thought that um, various issues and, and problems that um, the wider community are, are managing are also um, people are managing and struggling with within. Um, when I was seeing the a therapist, I got some therapy from the NHS, a sort of course of, I don't know what it was, 10 sessions or something. Mm -hmm. um, she would always say, I catastrophize. Mm. And I, I'd never heard that expression before. I really liked it. Mm. Is, do you think that's a queer situation to be in, catastrophizing? For for you, what would you say that kind of meant for you? Well, I, w I would always go to see this therapist and sort of almost treat it a bit like a stand-up gig. Okay. <laughs> so I would always, like, tell those anecdotes about what would happen. And there was always situations where I was, because there's so much stuff around, I always find it difficult to find things. And actually the finding of things becomes really stressful. So I can be like upturning boxes and throwing sort of like inflatable lobsters out of the way and wigs and kind of like mm. stockings and and trying to find the one thing. And I, it, it becomes really a big deal for me. Mm. And I feel like that might be less of a problem for like a straight guy <laughs> <laughs> i think we, i think we probably have all have the same kind of issues but in different ways but also yeah. i think i think i guess my reason for the question was when you're when you're part of a community which is on the fringe of society and it's marginalized by society and you're like a square peg fitting into a round hole that sometimes brings up a lot of psychological issues in itself. Yeah, yeah, I guess what I'd be curious about is what the environmental factors are and the sort of the sociological kind of factors are that are making somebody more vulnerable mm. um, to de then develop the sort of psychological issues that, as I said, you know, that actually everybody can, um, can struggle at times um, with mental health difficulty and, and that can be sort of acute or, or chronic. But what can make things worse for some people is yeah the sort of other uh factors that can kind of go into that and i think yeah as you say if if actually you come from a community where you felt really marginalized where for some people maybe they've been stigmatized by their kind of family they might have been kind of thrown out and and stuff which sadly i think even happens kind of in this day and even things in you know, in, in in the west certainly in other areas of the world and things as well where people can't be sort of quite as open and then so i mean that's straight away you know if somebody ends up actually becoming homeless or something that's a massive vulnerability sort of factor that will make make their mental health worse and similarly actually if somebody um has a really kind of loving supportive home environment and 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 all of that sort of stuff but but actually there may be drinking quite a lot taking a, a lot of drugs and, and things like that again that could potentially for some people be make them more vulnerable to developing different sorts of mental health sort of issues or problems if that gets out of control or, or if that then reacts with maybe a sort of um, a genetic kind of vulnerability or whatever so there's always sort of a a, a real mix of things um and um i think it's it's and I, and in a, a, another way i think that's a reason why i really enjoy psychology as well because you're, you're sort of you're thinking about yes you're thinking about the individual but you're also thinking more sort of wider more kind of systemically about the 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 family that they're in but the sort of the wider society and all that sort of thing and what these factors are that are impacting on somebody um because then you'd be thinking well okay we could work individually with this person but also what needs to maybe change in the wider uh, in their wider environment um, and to, how often to help? do you talk about childhood when you're having these conversations like is it talking therapy that you do yeah yeah so yes so that's a big part of of the work and um i mean i guess uh we certainly would talk about it as part of what we call kind of formulating uh, making a formulation of 
how everything fits together for the person for they because they might sort of rock up somewhere and be like I'm just I feel sad all the time and I'm crying and and this that and the other and so you would spend a fair few sessions working all this out with them and you might talk about their their childhood their sort of background and things to make sense of what's got them to this point where they are now um it's like a sort of working out the map sort of seeing what what is there um so childhood would be a part of that we talk um quite a lot about uh the impact that especially the early years sort of um environmental factors and parenting and things will have had on people in the early years because that has an impact on what we call um, like attachment and that can play out in lots of different ways in people's adult relationships both romantic sexual and um sort of peer relationships in, in working environments in all sorts of different areas uh, their particular attachment style which will have been affected in the first few years of life can have a, a massive knock-on effect so again that would be uh, why it would be useful and important to to talk a bit about somebody's childhood to get an understanding of, of that the particular way that, that I tend to work is very collaboratively and it would be um, working out with the person what what it is they feel are the issues um, and not making too many assumptions ab- about that um, but bringing some psychological thinking to that and some some theory and and models and things uh, to that but but essentially the the person themselves is the expert in their own experience um, so you would want to be getting to a point where they can they feel comfortable enough to be able to share and and you both make sense of that then together um, there's a lot of photos of me as a child where my mum's wearing a full-length fur coat and I'm inside that fur coat with just my head peeping out through the gaps in the buttonholes. Oh. What would you analyse from that? <laughs> <laughs> Those series of photographs oh, um, in terms of attachment therapy okay. theory. Um, um, how, did, um, how did she tend to react uh, with you being in the coat with her? I think she got quite tired of it after a while. (laughs) (laughs) Warm sharing a coat. Um, um, How did you feel when you were in the in the coat? Well, I think it's quite an animal thing, Mm. really. It feels very like. I mean, I sort of I made a show called "We Need to Talk About Bambi," and it was a little bit about that. The relationship between the mother and Bambi is so key. And and the father actually as well. I tried to draw comparisons okay. between my <laughs> parents in that show. Um, so you are Bambi. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Analyze um, that. Mm, I mean, I'd be I'd be interested in how you felt when you weren't in the coat and when your mum did she expel you from the coat? Did she I did she, she leave you in the coat? Did she take the coat off? I think she let me in there for a certain amount of time, but yeah, she got frustrated with <laughs> Limited it. Limited time, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, it's certainly um, interesting. I think um, you need to see the photos. I think I'd need to see the photos. <laughs> um, maybe I'd need to, yeah. You've really put him on the well. spot. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Therapy Hour <laughs> with Tom Marshman <laughs> and Andrew Hay Ferguson. <laughs> Do you still have the coat? I actually wear the coat out now myself. Ah, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah. okay. I said to her, this is very interesting." Yeah, I said, "Can I have that fur coat, Mum?" Was she, and now was I just she wear happy it. to? Was she happy to hand it on? Yeah, because you know, lots of people don't really like people wearing fur now, no. do they? Really controversial. Mm. I think if it's historical fur, it's fine, isn't it? Well, yeah. It's just new fur that's bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't really do much about historical fur. I mean, those animals are dead. So <laughs> uh, you've probably seen me wearing it. I have. Is it brown? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It rings a bell, a furry bell. Can I ask a question? Mm. What's the difference between a mimosa and a buck's fizz? <laughs> Well, I thought it was just that... Um, Yours got a fly in it. Yeah, I just got rid of that. <laughs> I think that just came over my way. Um, I used to think that it was just that the Americans call them mimosas and UK, we call it... A Bucks, Bucks Fizz. Fizz. But then someone said that a mimosa and a Bucks Fizz are actually... They're slightly different ingredients. 
But I, so I don't think I actually make it right. I think this is just a box phase. Oh. I think it's. T- I th- I thought it was like what time of day you've drunk it. So it was a mimosa in the morning. <laughs> yeah, but Buck's Fizz is in the morning as well. I would say Buck's Fizz in the morning, mimosas in the evening. I like it all the time. Is it your favourite drink? It's a, a birthday favourite and a Christmas favourite. So I own at other times I only have it like it is our very birthday. rarely. It is our birthday. It's a, we're we're celebrating we two years. Well, there we go. And Andy, we're up for an award as well. By the time this comes out, we'll know whether we've won or not. <laughs> Can I have a share in the uh, reward? Of course you can. Reward? Award? Yeah. We also, <laughs> mention, reward? we also mentioned the wedding which you were at. <gasps> well, there we go. Weren't you? I was. You were there. Yeah, that's, that's when we decided to have you on the show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was the fateful day. We decided. <laughs> <laughs> it was just that when you came up, it came out with a double doctorate. So what's yeah. the difference between a clinical yes. psychologist and a health psychologist? Yes. Okay. So the, well, the, the training, uh, the training routes are, are different. Mm. Um, and the jobs that you can get are different. I mean, my understanding is because see, I'm both now, there's more jobs available within clinical psychology, or at least more jobs that, that I kind of want to get more into mm. um particularly within men- mental health i mean health psychology training doesn't train you um within more sort of kind of full-on mental health stuff lots of the things we we looked at within health psychology training was like sort of health behavior models and um why people maybe do things the, the way they do when they're unwell or when they need to change um why they're not necessarily changing um so like giving up smoking or something like that um and it's kind of epidemiology and doctor patient communication lots of research grounding although saying that there's lots of research that we do within clinical psychology training as well so in both health psychology and clinical psychology uh we're known as scientist practitioners so um we both uh, do research and work from a science a scientific base a research base um but also practice um therapeutically um and so that's often called uh, the scientist practitioner model how does dressing up as pam sandwich and mother affect your mental health mm, i think it probably there's a part of it i think that probably negatively affects my mental health because um i always drink quite a lot when I do drag well because it's always on a night out and it's sort of I'm kind of drinking while I'm getting ready and things mm. and and so that then we see alcohol has a depressive effect and and sort of the next day and increasingly now I'm getting older the the kind of the feeling down kind of afterwards and maybe feeling a bit more anxious and things afterwards can t- be a bit longer mm. um but the answer to that be to not drink so much um but it's 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 a weird one because people have 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 said like i've I've got a friend from school actually who who i'm still um in touch with and he said a while ago that he thought when he found out that i was doing sort of drag stuff he was kind of like oh wow you're you're so brave you're that you're so confident to kind of do that and i was like no no it's not that's not the case at all because it's like it's a feel like I'm kind of wearing a mask when I'm doing mm. it, which I think is is often maybe what what, what people might say. Um, and because you're kind of for me, I'm kind of hiding behind that. But also sometimes I think I feel like I I need to kind of drink to be more kind of effervescent person, and, and yeah. yeah, kind of in mm. in it in the mm. in the time. So I'd be interested to see what it was would be like if I didn't drink so much, kind of doing it. Mm. Um, because I still have the the mask and the armor of of mm. it of the of which the... which in turn allows you to do stuff yeah. which perhaps Andy wouldn't ordinarily do yeah yeah and I think it also other people allow for that as well because it's kind of like it's a it's almost an understanding that this person is playing a role and and it's in an environment where it's kind of playful and and people are relaxed and things so it would it's it's okay to to kind of be like that so. Yeah, as I say, it's probably more about just overindulging in alcohol at the moment when I'm doing it that that has more of the negative effect. But that's not the that's not the drag itself. That's what I feel I need to get into it. 
and I suspect I don't necessarily need that. But at the moment, that's kind of that's what ends up happening. But then I know there have been occasions when I've I've then drunk too much, kind of gone too far, and then not felt like I've kind of really later then reflecting on that felt like I I don't like that version of me that mm. that mm. like if I if I was kind of split into and met myself when I was like that I don't think I would like that person but then it's kind of it's it's got too far yeah. so I think it's sort of initially it feels like yeah I, I I need this to to be more to be me plus plus and and confident I think it's a confidence thing it's yeah. definitely feeling that um yeah it's that it's interesting because I'm also then thinking with my sort of psychologist hat on oh, what, what would I be saying to this person if they were saying oh I, I but I need the alcohol <laughs> to be able to do this I can't do it out and as a psychologist I might be curious with the person to be like well, I wonder what would happen if you didn't and you did you still did the drag and you didn't have as much to drink I wonder what would happen yeah um because to go back to the catastrophizing um thing as well and there's probably a part of me that catastrophizes around it and is like but I won't have anything to say and I'll be this really dull person and and nobody will want to talk to me and it'll just be yeah it'll just be it'll just be awkward awful yeah um but that's just in my mind I don't yeah. know that that's gonna happen because I've never tested it out I've just catastrophized that that will be what will happen so it keeps you in this keeps me in this loop I guess um, yeah yeah wow um, I bet you didn't expect to analyse yourself tonight, no, did you? No. <laughs> wow, I mean, it's so interesting and it's we're, it's fabulous to have you on. We do a little section called Queens of Agony. Oh, yeah. Will you please stay on and actually give some proper advice yes. <laughs> instead of our <laughs> yes, <laughs> nonsense okay. that we normally <laughs> give? Yes. <laughs> okay, we're going to, I'll do a big gong. So, Queens of Agony. Uh, oh, I know what I was going to say. Liz Watch. Liz Watch. That, we're called What That Old Queen. We've got an old queen. She's coming up for a Platinum Jubilee next year. How's she looking this week? Um, have you seen her? No, but I have seen Kate Middleton. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Did and you I, see her? No. Absolutely gorgeous dress. I didn't like the hair. Right. At the um, 007 show. Oh, well, the oh, premiere. Yeah. I, did. I saw him yeah. eating, and he was, we- he was wearing a, a purple jacket. Mm. Mm. Yes, and I saw her talking to him. Like mm. a smoking jacket, I yeah. thought. Yeah. 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 It was sort of plum. Plum, plum, plum yeah. 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 Mm. But Liz, how she's looking? Because we've got an inordinate amount of bank holidays next year mm. because of the Platinum Jubilee. I want to make mm. sure it's happening. Oh, gosh, so yeah. is she looking all right this week or not? I don't think she was at the. Um, she wasn't. She, was, she wasn't at the. She wasn't at the royal premiere. No, but she, but she has worked with James Bond in the past. Yeah, well, they dropped yeah. her out of a plane, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, at the Olympics. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I thought she would should have won a gold spidey. medal for that. <laughs> she is the ultimate Bond girl. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And on List Women today, they had Britt Eklund. Did they? <laughs> She's a definite Bond girl. Yes. How She's was she the- looking? I mean, it, she was on Zoom, so it was hard, but. Was she wearing the white bikini? <laughs> no, she wasn't. And the knife in her mouth. <laughs> I but, thought that was Ursula Andress. Oh. What did, <laughs> but, what did no, but, Brett wear? I've got two comments on what you just said. Janet Street Porter did a sort of pseudo Ursula Andress thing, and she wore a bikini, mm. but with a sort of flesh suit underneath and a knife down her bikini bottoms. Mm. What did, what did Brett Br- Eklund wear? She wore something sort of slightly hippie-ish, I think. And I saw her on the real hotel. What's that show called? The Hotel Marigold thing. You know that? Oh, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where they get real old people. Oh, right. Yeah. And she really had the hots for Valentine Guy. <laughs> it was oh, quite really? embarrassing. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Anyway, well, maybe that will be one of our questions in the Queens of Agony. Um, so, dear, are you ready for the first question? Yes. Okay. Dear old Queens and Andy, I mean, who is he kidding? Um, <laughs> How old are you, Andy? 41. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think you could be classed as an old queen. Um, <laughs> what's the difference between embracing my masculinity 
and acting straight. I mean, it's quite topical to what we, we've just been talking about. I've been getting a steady stream of complaints from other gay men that I don't act or look gay enough to be gay. Probably about five or four a month. It's interesting that he's counting them. I've, I even get it from straight folks too. I find myself sometimes making a concerted effort to put that lisping twang in my voice or that limp yeah. wrist thing, and it's just not me. <laughs> Y'all know how I can strike a balance, or is there another thing I should be doing in, in therapy for? Mm. Are they saying, you know, when they say, like, you'll, you'll know how, is that like an affected thing? <laughs> I don't know. Well, maybe it is. Oh, maybe no. he's trying to be a bit oh, camp no. with it. Mm. Y'all know well, how I can strike a balance, or is this another thing I should be in therapy for? Mm. There's a lot to unpack here. Isn't I mean, there? you're the expert. Yes. What should they, should they be in therapy well, for this? No. So I think, first of all, I would be interested at, at, at the beginning, I think, where he's saying, pre- presume this is a man. I think so. That, that uh, he's saying he didn't know how to embrace mas- his masculinity, was it? Or, or, or I think he is quite. To... I think the the thing is, is that he's quite masculine, yeah. and people are asking how come he's gay because yeah, he's quite masculine. Yeah. We haven't unpacked what masculinity is. No, and I, I think that it's. I, I no, think it's that it's. Um, I wonder who is asking these sort of things of him. If they're just kind of strangers and things, it would be like, well, it doesn't matter what other people think. Although it is hard when people keep kind of saying that stuff to you. Or if these are sort of people who are supposed to be his friends who are saying, you're not gay enough. I mean, what does that even mean? Yeah. And, and like, I think, again, it feels like going back to what we talked about, like, in terms of like mask before like why can't masculinity actually be wider than just a very kind of narrow definition why does it have to be um, a very sort of specific thing that is linked to just one thing in this case seemingly being straight that's what masculinity is is linked to it's like well that's ridiculous and i mean he doesn't need any therapy i think he needs some supportive friends. Um, mm. What about a fireman outfit? <laughs> <laughs> With some diamante over the um, over the top. I think if you camp up that fireman outfit, he, he's mm. going to feel better about himself. Uh, yeah, it's almost like the antithesis of what we were saying before, isn't it? Because <laughs> mm. it's it's again, it's just other people's views about what being part of the LGBTQIA plus community is, and it's just like. Yeah, people can be whatever they want and they can present in however way they want. The fact that he likes sleeping with men doesn't mean that he needs to act in a certain way. No, no. It's, yeah, because he's sort of, he's he's hinting towards like some stereotypes about, oh, should I list? Should I have a linked wrist and all this sort of stuff? It's like, no. I mean, he may be joking saying that or actually he may be kind of considering, do I have to start to change how I present to, mm. to fit in more? And it's it just seems really regressive because it's like, well... If he was he, if he was pretending to be something that he's not, which he doesn't sound like he is, because he's saying I'm gay and I'm just I'm quite masculine. That's okay. Yeah. If he was saying I'm gay and I have a lisp and I have a limp wrist, but I pretend to be masculine, maybe that would be more problematic because he's having to change himself for other people. Whereas what would be better would be if he could just be himself and and feel comfortable with that. Yeah. So yeah, no, he he doesn't need. Therapy, in my expert opinion. Do, do I need therapy? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, let's move on, shall we? Unless, Tommy, you had anything more to say about that. I was just going to say, why does it all bog down to getting therapy? But then I, he did write at the end, do I need therapy? Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't, I was that up. it wasn't all about <laughs> analyse this. Yeah, I didn't kind of want... Uh, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, um... I'm going to move on. Dear old queens, this is quite a big one. Oh, hello. Big and juicy. So listeners, sit down for this. Dear old queens, I don't know how to identify my feelings thanks to 30 years of denial and repression. Next page. Next question. No. (laughs) (laughs) No, apologies. So I've come out in the past year and have started dating for the first time ever. I'm seeing this guy and I really like him, I think. 
I don't really know what liking someone, let alone loving someone, is supposed to feel like. I can't even tell if I like him or just the companionship. I mean, I do like him, but in the context of the relationship, what is that supposed to feel like? It doesn't help that I don't have a strong sense of personal identity. I assume this is a prerequisite to fulfilment in general. All I feel is affection, confusion, vulnerability, shame. I know I want him to like me and I want to spend time with him, but I'm also trying not to be naive and fall head over heels after less than one month of seeing him. Most of this is moot since he's in an open relationship and I'm the side hustle, which is painful in its own way. But it has made me realise 30 years of trying not to feel anything has really made me, surprise, unable to process my feelings in any sort of productive way. And yes, I'm in therapy, LOL. Wow, that was a big one. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) There's a lot going on there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd I'd be... um, what occurs to me, um, I mean, I'm glad this person is um, is talking to somebody professional about this. Um, be really curious about why it's been sort of 30 years that they haven't been able to, I presume from what they were saying, sort of be in a relationship with, with somebody or, or sort of feel that they can kind of process feelings and things. I'd be worried that they've experienced something quite traumatic in the past. Um, mm. I mean, that that's sort of what this has got a flavour of. That That's what would feel like to me if this was like say a sort of clinic letter that was coming in or something a referral for somebody um do you think it is because uh, it sounds like he's only really just come out yeah and so there's been a lot of repressing who he was for a long time yeah yeah i mean it feels like they've, they've had a really difficult time um and um it's understandable that they're feeding all over the place at the moment um i mean before they said that this person they're seeing was actually in an open relationship and they're just kind of being seen on the side and stuff. I was going, going to suggest that they, I, th- I thought this was somebody that they were seeing maybe in a monogamous relationship um, or at least um, sort of seeing they were primarily just seeing each other. Um, and I would have suggested at that point, just kind of trying to be open as open as they can with this person. Mm. Um, if that was what they if they wanted to be this person and they wanted kind of longevity with them and things like that. Um, though when they said that actually they're just sort of a bit on the side kind of thing, I'd be curious as to how helpful that kind of relationship is for them, seeing as they seem to be quite damaged and vulnerable, um, mm. that, that this might not be uh, the most helpful uh, place this might not be the most helpful relationship for them to be in at the moment um, Mm. with how they are. Um, But I would presume that that might be things that they'd be talking with their, with their therapist about. Do you think that open relationships in, in general can be quite problematic for some people? Because it is very, the, the thing is, is that there's no reason why, the companionship or the relationship with this person couldn't develop into something more, even though they're they're in a relationship with somebody else, and it is an open relationship. But do you do you think sometimes it's not helpful for some people to be in an open relationship or or part of that? Yeah, I mean, I think that it it, it can probably um, work for lots of people and also then be quite problematic for for other people. I wonder whether what would make it more helpful uh would be as well as the relationship being open the communication being open and there being honesty within that um because i could imagine that um it's it could get difficult quite quickly um if people started to want something else or something different from what they had at the beginning um, and that feelings might change or feelings might develop in different ways um, that might make it become a bit more messy mm. um, and then that might yeah just make things harder for some people um, but that's not to say that it can't work because I know that lots of people have open relationships and that that, that does work 
what Andy gave beautiful advice. I didn't really have that much to add apart from that maybe he's perceiving that he is a side hustle. He might not be, you know, he's mm. yeah, really yeah. got his word for it. So it, I, true, I would say try and open up to this person and see what happens. And then that might, there's no reason why he couldn't be open and honest. And yeah, that, that yeah. partner could also share that. Yeah. yeah and it's, yeah, the, and just because they're, uh, they're in an open relationship doesn't mean that they also don't want another kind of emotional connection mm. with somebody else, especially if they've been seeing someone over a period of time. Uh, I think there's, there's sometimes a disconnect with open relationships where, you perceive yourself or someone is perceived as a side hustle and there's no emotional exchange there. It is just a sexual transactional kind of thing. Whereas it doesn't always necessarily have to be that, or it doesn't always, it isn't always necessarily that, you know, there's more to it. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. And, and um, actually I hadn't considered that, that they, it, the situation actually could be quite different. It, it seems like they're, they're not talking with this this partner um, about any of this stuff mm. from what from what it says there. So I agree. I think um, yeah, just talking with them, being open about how they're feeling about this, and um, kind of where they're at. It was a long letter, but we needed a longer one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm going to put that on a t shirt. We need a longer letter. Um, <laughs> okay, you like Andy. You mentioned something was messy earlier on, and I'm going to segue into the next question with that, which will be messy in a different way. The bottom you just had sex with oh. wasn't as clean as he said. Would you still hook up with him next time, or no? And the explanation of this is, I kind of shat on a guy's dick, though I did douche properly. He seemed to enjoy the session and said, no worries, but I'm wondering if he's done with me and how would you react? Is it because that person hasn't sort of responded by saying, yeah, let's meet up again? Well, or... he, he, but he, I mean, he has said that. He said that he would. I mean... Uh, I, I wonder whether there's a little bit of catastrophizing going on here uh, with, this, with this person. Um, I mean, let's be honest. Look, if we're having, if if we're having sex, uh, anal sex, me, there yeah. will be <laughs> shit involved sometimes. It, yeah, shit um, happens. Exactly, and so you know we need to be adults about this. And if people are gonna get all funny about it, okay, maybe there's an, an issue there or or not um and i think this probably for this person if if this is somebody that they it doesn't really make clear whether this is just sort of a one-off thing or whether this is somebody that they're seeing or whatever but again i think as we said with the last one uh it would make sense to try and talk about this um to try and bring it up <laughs> in some way yeah, um, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, even, I think we've talked about this before on here, haven't we? Where we've had little, like, I mean, probably. Little accidents happen, especially when you're having buggery bum sex. Um, <laughs> and it's just like, well, it, it, it does just happen. I don't, I don't understand how, like, back in the day when I first came out, no one used to douche in this country. In the UK, I know it's like a real American thing because they like everything clean, but no one used to do that. It was all very impromptu and you just do it. And sometimes it might be a bit messy. Sometimes it wouldn't be. Mm. And there's stuff that you can do with that. What do you mean? Well, there's, I mean, there's supplements you can take. There's change in diet, oh, okay. you know, that can help with all of that stuff. And you can douche. But, you know, sometimes... What is the change in diet then? Well, it's just... Less have... fibre. Um, or less fruit and veg. It's or, yeah. It's just a lot of bread, apparently. Um, <laughs> or you could shove a load of bread up. Uh, or from. fiber supplements. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually specific supplements you can buy. But it's for gay men, so that they are cleaner when when they have anal sex. Didn't know that. Did you not? There's was pure for men, and there's some others as Did well. You know that? No. Well, that's that's the advice. Yeah, that you could. So pop, pop a few of those pills through. So yeah, I think it takes a little Bob's while. You get a few days or something to work, um, and you obviously have to drink water with it. Um, <laughs> but 
yeah, there's stuff that you can do. But also, I feel, I feel like everybody's a bit hung up on, you know. Bodily stuff. Crap happening. And like sex is messy. Mm. It is messy. And it's, but it's also enjoyable. So it's not going to be some clinically clean thing all the time. Mm. And I think people are a lot more hung up on that yes. than they should be. Yeah. There's a lot of peer pressure in these questions this mm. evening, aren't there? Mm-hmm. I'm going to move on to cake. <laughs> Yummy. <laughs> From a cream pie to a cake. <laughs> or a chocolate pie. Who knows? Anyway, um, dear old queens, this is the final question, by the way. So, okay. you know, I want you to pen a thing for this. Do you still serve cake at adult parties? My partner recently celebrated a birthday by having a few friends over. I ordered a cake for the occasion and set it out for dinner. The, the guests seemed genuinely surprised to see the cake. After singing happy birthday, I cut a few slices and put them on dessert plates. No one touched them. I thought maybe they were being shy and no one wanted to take the first piece, so I offered them out. Everyone was either off gluten or on a diet or not interested in having that much <laughs> sugar. It made me wonder if... <laughs> If not eating cake at an adult birthday party was the norm these days, and I just missed the memo. What are your thoughts? At every party I've been to, everyone loves cake. Same. I yeah. think this person needs different friends. Yeah. I, I think they've got a cake. <laughs> they sound very tiresome. I think a divorce. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> a divorce from the friends, if not the part. I hope the partner ate the cake. Well, it As sounds well. like it sounds like the the partner didn't eat the cake, the friends didn't eat the cake. It sounds like the the main person was the only person who sang happy birthday and then the only person who ate the cake. Yeah. They need they need a different they need to take the cake and go somewhere else. Or I mean if you like the cake that much, it's going to be great for you because you're just going to be the one that's eating it. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something about something beautiful about the arriving with a cake, a beautiful cake and then it's the centrepiece of the table, and mm. then everyone says, what beautiful cake. Mm. So I can see the real sense of disappointment that people aren't yeah. like, because... Yeah. I like to make a big... Not, I, I like to buy a cake for my birthday and have it as a thing. I like several cakes for my birthday. I always want cake, basically. Mm. Well, I, I don't understand why you wouldn't. I mean, I understand the thing about the gluten and the... What's the other one? Celiac. But you, can, but you can get gluten-free, yeah. sugar-free cake. Mm. I mean, it may not be as nice. Yeah. But, it's, but, a, but it's, a bit, it's a bit rude as well. I mean, if these people have come to this party and they're being really snooty about the cake, I mean, sometimes I've not wanted to have cake, but I have a bit because that's, like, polite, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Like, it's rude if someone's provided something and you're not partaking Although when you said adult party, initially I thought you meant a sex party. <laughs> and that, so that did sound strange that there'd be a cake there. So I Actually, was like, well, that's may- maybe why. Maybe they did mean that. Mm, I would, maybe I still think that's a nice thing to finish off you get, with. So if, <laughs> you get hungry at some point. <laughs> also, you? you know, some people like a messy yeah. kind of kink. Well, you know, they like to stick yeah. the cake in every orifice mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know why why would why would you not want to do that maybe that's what the other people thought and they were confused as to why they were cutting up slices and putting them on plates because they were like i want that all uh, over I want, me. I, I want that not on a plate yeah uh, so actually in that scenario a lot of cake is your best option isn't it lots. it's like several quite cakes. creamy lots of cream sloppy Squirty cream. It's got lots of squirty cream. I would say. Um, I love a bit of squirty cream. And the person cream. should bring it out nude so that yeah. there's no confusion. No confusion. <laughs> With some squirty cream on their penis. <laughs> and their nipples. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. I think so. And maybe some chocolate buttons. Where would they be? Anywhere you like. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely anywhere you like. Yes. What's your favourite cake, Andy? Um, Victoria sponge. Uh, you can't beat a Victoria sponge, can you? I really? like that my favourite thing is buttercream icing. So, oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I could just eat like buttercream lots icing, of that. But, yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. Tommy, what's your favourite cake? Orange drizzle. <laughs> orange drizzle. <laughs> is it orange? I thought it was lemon. 
Lemon drizzle. You lemon drizzle cake. Have an orange drizzle if you want. No, it's like dark chocolate with orange. Oh. Oh. I think that's, that's yeah, that's a bit more sophisticated. Sure that's what my mum made. Oh, nice. Mm. Like a chocolate orange cake. Was it moist? Quite moist. Yeah. <laughs> I like, well, I loved my version, which was actually a Victoria sponge, but with chocolate, which was my, um, what that old queen Ooh, cake, nice. which I made at the beginning of lockdown last year. But I love a Boston cake, which is often called a Boston mud pie. Oh. But it's kind of... That's like the previous question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of merging all of those questions yeah. in together, really. <laughs> so um, if anyone has a perfect recipe for a Boston cake, please send it in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, I think we've come... Uh, after all that talk about cake, I'm a bit hungry. Uh, I think we've come to the end of the episode. Andy, thank you so much for thank coming on much. board. It was all a bit serious. I think, you know, we might win an award for this one. Um, it could be on Radio 4, really, couldn't it? I thought Today's it episode. Was. Oh, yeah, Ooh. we are. Um, <laughs> 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 thank you so much. How, where, can, where can people find you in terms of Mother from Don't Tell Your Mother or Pam Sandwich and the um, like? Um, Instagram? Uh, yeah. Pam used to have an Instagram she doesn't anymore. Oh, why is that? She's been banned. Oh, that would have been exciting, wouldn't it? No, I, just, <laughs> I got bored of um, logging into it. So I deleted it. Oh, okay. She's still alive. Okay. Her Instagram isn't. You haven't excommunicated her. <laughs> no. My okay. Instagram is Andy Wolfson. Okay. Do you want loads of people <laughs> clicking on your Instagram? Oh, dear. <laughs> they will now. It's private, so I can. Um, it's private. I okay. Can um, you. But if you're in not. the in the Bristol area and I don't tell your mother is on, mm. mother may very well mother be may there. Well, be there. They're doing um, uh, DTYM in November, but unfortunately, mother won't be at that one. Uh, but she may be at a following one. So watch okay. this space. Okay. Great. Fabulous. Tommy, is there anything else you'd like to say? I'm desperate for the we. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, say goodbye then, Tommy. Goodbye. Okay. <laughs> Andy, please say goodbye to our lovely audience. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. We will see you next time on What That Old Queen. You have been listening to What That Old Queen, written and presented by Tom Marshman and Bernie Hodges. The show was produced by Bernie Hodges for Hodge Podcasting in 2021. If you have a question for the old queens, or you'd like to be a guest, or you want to sponsor a show and give us lots of money, you can email hello at thatoldqueen.com or find us on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter.